For me, one of the things of most beauty is that this hidden part of the world is so undisturbed. With the stories that I bring back from the archipelago, I'm desperate to share some of the childlike enthusiasm that I have every time I dive on these reefs. It's chaos. It's like looking at a city from above. There are tiny fish weaving in and out of the coral colonies. There are turtles swimming past. There are spinner dolphins leaping out of the oceans. Sharks gazing at those steely black eyes of theirs. the last land behind about an hour ago uh, for another 20 hours so it's uh, basically uh, open ocean as far as the eye can see and a tiny swell has picked up we're in the Chagos archipelago one of the most remote coral reef systems in the world in the central Indian Ocean about 500 kilometers south of the Maldives 1,500 kilometers uh, to the west is the Seychelles and about 3,000 kilometers to the east is Indonesia. What a day to be a marine biologist. Look at that. It's March 2020 and the world is about to change in a way that none of us could foresee. This part of the world is one of the most special areas in the world. This is the crown jewel of coral reef systems. Readings that were taken showed that the waters here are some of the most pristine and cleanest on the planet. On the research vessel that we're on, we have very limited internet, but messages and news reports were beginning to come in of a novel coronavirus. Suddenly we got the call that all of the countries bordering the Indian Ocean region were shutting their borders. found ourselves having to abort this expedition. And on one of the final dives, I found one of the most shocking discoveries of my time in the Chagos Archipelago. A once thought to be extinct coral, the Chagos brain coral. It was a particularly bittersweet moment for me, not knowing whether I was going to see this particular coral species again. Okay. Here we have um, some of these uh, specimens that were collected at the Chagos Archipelago about 100 years ago. This is the very same brain coral you have been trying to find in the field diving. I don't know whether to be overjoyed by the, the, the number of corals in this collection considering that's more corals than I've actually seen live in the archipelago. And of course these were collected at a very different time when this coral was one of the 25 most abundant species in the region. Well, we can actually use these specimens, uh, take out this DNA and to learn how was the diversity back then, before these uh, bleaching events have kind of shrink the populations into very tiny little places where they can kind of survive. Of course, as you know, uh, Nadia, in 2015, 2016, we had what was called this double dipole event. Mm -hmm. These two years where the water temperatures were much higher than they should normally have been. Yes, yes. So it, it was actually really difficult 
a time for the coral because they didn't even have time to recover. And what it really touches me is that we actually witness that when corals basically disappear for a couple of years. They all bleach. They, we, we thought we actually would lose them forever. Wow! Look at that! Almost a full year had elapsed. <laughs> to find myself once more again, bobbing around on an inflatable boat in azure tropical waters in the middle of a global pandemic was something of a, a feverish dream. I'd been waiting so long to have access to these reefs again, to see whether this species had continued to hold on by the very tips of its polyps. There was a wonderful level of camaraderie on these expeditions with all of the team members pitching in to try and find this coral. And nine out of every 10 times that my heart would begin to race, it was a false alarm. I looked down into the depths and had a double take. And as I looked more closely, it was actually Chagos brain coral, Tanella Chagos. Further on, there were two more colonies, and then along this reef wall, what looked like 15 or 16 of this extraordinary, iconic and enigmatic coral. One of the major priorities for me in this research is to try and work out how this coral reproduces. To truly stand a chance of saving this coral, we need to know more about its biology and most importantly, it's reproductive biology. It's spawning. When we think about any animal, reproduction is obviously the, the process of generating new generations. And corals reproduce in really small windows of time. 15 minutes, they're releasing eggs and sperm up into the water, and that's it, 15 minute window once a year. With Tonella being so rare, we find one of the problems is that the distances between colonies are so great. My big worry is that actually, potentially, there is going to be no external fertilization. Absolutely. I mean, I think density within a population plays a huge role in fertilization success. And so when you get below a certain threshold in density, the fertilization probability also goes down because they become more dispersed. And so when they do spawn, there's less chance that those eggs and sperm can mix to fertilize and create the next generation. And you know, that's where intervention is needed to collect these eggs and sperm, perform that fertilization manually um, to reseed a population. So obviously, Jamie, one of the reasons that I know you best is, is the wonderful ex situ spawning work you do here at the Horniman Museum. Could you explain to us a little bit about the system behind you? Yeah, so we, it took quite a few years to develop um, an aquarium that can replicate all of the environmental parameters that occur on a natural reef. But we can do that in southeast London here. And so using microprocessors attached to each of these aquariums, we can simulate the, the sunrise, the sunset, the arc of the sun in the sky. Also the lunar cycle can be replicated, the seasonal temperature changes. So the corals behind me, they truly think, think in inverted commas, because corals don't think, but they behave as though they are on a wild reef. And that is an incredibly powerful tool because it means you can understand that reproductive behavior very, very well and then plan a whole strategy around how you manage that fertilization. to come across a pod of false killer whales yesterday, which I assumed would be a, the collective noun would be a fallacy, surely, of false 
killer whales. And uh, saw a wonderful waterspout come up. Um, shooting stars are just uh, incredible. Of course, the skies here are uh, just bustling with, with incredible stars. The months that I have back in Oxford at my desk analysing all of the data is very different to being out on the open ocean. Each day tends to be kind of a, a bit like Christmas. You look at it now and it is, is like a mirror, like a mer de huile, as the French would say. Wow. Birds galore. A necessary evil of the life of a marine biologist is the analysis of all this data when we return back to terra firma. And in Oxford, I find myself in something of a quandary because, of course, in the United Kingdom, it's about as far from the sea as it's possible to be. But always in the back of my mind is the feeling that the secrets that I unlock in these dry and often tawdry data analyses provide the questions for the follow-up expedition. Hi Fran, you're obviously part of the Zoological Society of London's Edge of Existence programme. Could you tell us a little bit about this programme and why it's so important for species like the Chagas brain coral? Yes, of course, Greg. Um, the Edge of Existence programme focuses on conserving species that are evolutionarily distinct. A species that is evolutionarily distinct is a species that sits in the tree of life mostly by itself. So it has very few relatives and it sits in a very, very long branch. So it has a, a wealth of evolutionary history in it. And H stands for evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. The peculiarity of the Chagos brain coral is precisely that it only occurs, or has been confirmed to only occur, in the Chagos Archipelago. The return back from these expeditions is always something of a mixed bag. On the one hand, of course, there's a certain degree of freedom. But there's also something of a sadness, because every time we go out to these reefs, they never quite look the same as they did the year beforehand. On my return for these expeditions, I feel compelled to share these experiences of being in this part of the world. One of the last dwindling wilderness areas on this planet.